welcome back to our already last session for this summer of the New Voices talk series in cooperation with the CSMBR on food, plants, remedies and healing practices, women's ideas in the history of uh, medicine. Today, we welcome uh, Amaya Chirito. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Trento, where she works on a project titled Between Science and Myth, Albert the Great, his sources and his fellow followers. She is currently lecturer at the same university where she teaches history of philosophy from the late antiquity to the Middle Ages. And her research focuses on the intersection between philosophy, medicine and theology in the 13th century embryology. Her PhD thesis was awarded by the Santoria Award for Excellence in Research and recently published with the title Albert the Great and the Configuration of the Embryo Virtus Formativa. She published several articles on the theoretical background of Albert the Great's zoology and botany, with a special focus on the Neoplatonic influence on Albert's natural philosophy. She is associate member of the Center for the Study of Medicine and the Body in the Renaissance, CSMBR, of the Italian Society for the Study of Medieval Thought, and of the Center for the Edition of Philosophical Medieval and Renaissance Texts. Uh, many thanks, Amalia, for the speaking to, uh, to us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Fabrizio, for inviting me here. And uh, I would like to share my screen. Let me... Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Um, good evening to everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, Today we are going to talk about Albert the Great that uh, extensively discussed the vegetal sexuality. Um, why animals were produced by mating of female and male individuals, plants lack sexual organ and reproduce through seeds that contain all the necessary conditions for plants generation. Uh, despite the evident differences in animal and plant generation, Albert uses a concept such as male and female, motherhood and fatherhood to explain vegetal sexuality. Um, the, pre the presence of sexual organs um, in plants was discovered in the 17th century by Rudolf Jacobus Camerarius uh, that were conducted a sort of experiment um, uh, to prove that plants exhibit sexual differentiation and reproduce through sexual organs like animals. Uh, his discovery was published in, in uh, the Sex Plantarum Epistola, but was mostly ignored by his contemporary um, botanists, and uh, uh, was uh, uh, only in uh, the, in the 1862 when uh, uh, Charles Darwin was involved in the same question about the sex of plants that he uh, Darwin rediscovered this kind of this uh, publication of uh, uh, Camerarius and make it public to the scientific community. Uh, However, the question of how plants embody sexual differences and the extent to which an animal model can, apply, can be applied to explain vegetal reproduction had already been debated by, way before Camerarius' discovery and continues to be an object of discussion even today. Uh, in uh, 2023, Stella Sanford published the Vegetal Sex, uh, in which she offers a reevaluation of the contribution of the long tradition of plant philosophy to the question of plant sex. Uh, she approaches to the history of botany and modern plant science from a philosophical perspective, mapping the significant moment of thought and discovery of plant sex from Aristotle to the contemporary times. Um, in her analysis, uh, Sanford uh, illustrates the influence of the Aristotelian natural philosophy uh, in a later conceptualization uh, of vegetal sexuality, and she devotes several pages to Albert the Great, the Vegetabilibus et Plantis. Um, Albert the Great, let me give you a brief in, in, information about Albert the Great that was a, a magister uh, um, uh, of theology at the University of Paris during the first half of the 13th century and then he moves uh, to Germany in Cologne to find, to, to, for the foundation of the Dominican Studium Generale of Cologne. Um, where uh, um, he was entrusted to, 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 to um, 
shape a Dominican curriculum uh, for, for his fellows. And uh, he comments on the entire Aristotelian corpus and even on that works that uh, were attributely, uh, were um, attributed mistakenly to Aristotle, such as uh, the, 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 the plantis. And the Vegetabilibus et Plantis is a commentary on the pseudo Aristotelian De Plantis that was actually written by Nicolas of Damascus in the second century BC. Um, in every construction, um, Sanford places uh, the Dominican master Albert the Great among the Aristotelian plant philosopher. Uh, alongside Nicolas of Damascus and Cesalpino, who investigate to what extent the philosophical categories of male and female can be applied to plant. The way in which ancient and medieval plant philosophers deal with vegetal sexuality depends on the triple categorization of male and female that uh, was made by Aristotle in his works. Aristotle distinguished male and female both as, as reproductive organs or as individual substances, but also as metaphysical principles. And uh, um, according to Sanford reading, uh, Albert the Great denied not only that uh, plants lack um, sexual organs or individual uh, um, sexuality is not distinguished in the individual substance in the male and female bodies, but also that Albert denies, uh, but also that Albert denies that uh, main plants have a male and female as metaphysical principles. And uh, she um, uh, drawn this conclusion because Albert uh, used the term uh, in vera sexus virtus, the expression vera sexus virtus, to describe the 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 the, 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 the way of reproduction of animals, and uh, while described the the the. The, the, the way of reproduction of plants in terms of imitatio, imitation. And she, she claims that, uh, in our view, between animals and plants, there ca cannot be made a, a real analogy, but just a remote similitudo, a remota similitudo. That is a Latin expression that we, we can translate as a remote similitude. Um, by a closer expression, expression of the use of the terms imitatio and the remota similitudo in Albert's philosophical commentaries, it appears clear that Albert does not use this term in a negative sense to deny the presence of male and female to do in plants. But if we contextualize within these terms within Albert, uh, Albert's Christian neoplatonic outlook on nature, these terms indicate that uh, they indicate uh, the last level of participation of the being at the same of the same archetypal model. Uh, in other view, the, the whole natural realm is ordered in grades of perfection, descending from the first cause. And at the top, we have the, at the hierarchy, we have angels and celestial bodies, and then we have human animals, non-human animals, plants and minerals. And according to these pictures, um, according to this picture, each level imitates the um, existence of the upper level of being by progressively losing perfection. In Albert's view, every natural being and process uh, participates more or less with the archetypal model present in the first cause, with which they express a similitude measurable in degrees of perfection. So, uh, Albert moves the idea that every natural being and process can be ordered by degrees of perfection from metaphysics to, epistemolo to the epistemology of natural sciences. And according to Albert, male and female, motherhood and fatherhood um, are evident in nature at varying levels, with the humans representing the most perfect nature and plants representing a lesser degree of perfection, the last degree of perfection. Um, as we are going to see today, it is true that Albert denies that plants display sexual, uh, sexually differentiated body, but it's not true uh, uh, that uh, uh, this is due to the fact that they lack male and female principles, but because they express this sexual differentiation according to their imperfect nature. 
um, I this, uh, this lecture is divided in two parts. In the first one, I will reconstruct Albert's doctrine on vegetal sexuality using an interdisciplinary approach. Um, I will argue that even though Albert was influenced by Aristotelian natural philosophy, he deal with the question of sex in plants from a neoplatonic perspective, adopting the criterion of scale of perfection to explain, of course, the, the way in which plants reproduce. In the second part, I will focus on how Albert employs concept as a female body, seed, and power in his investigation on vegetal sexuality. By developing the analogy between the uterus, the soil, mother, he adapts the Galenic humoral complexion theory to the soil and identifies maternal and feminine properties and powers even in the simplest living body, that is that of plants. Let's move on to the first part of this uh, presentation that is devoted to the reconstruction of the doctrine of vegetal sexuality of Albert the Great. Albert the Great um, um, extensively discusses vegetal sexuality in his theological and philosophical works. Here, here we have, uh, um, uh, um, um, in order, in chronological order, all the, the, the works where Albert deal with the topic of vegetal sexuality. And, um, but one of the most thorough treatments of the subject is found in De Vegetabilibus et Plantis, which is a paraphrastic commentary on the two books of the pseudo-Aristotelian works, The Plantis, as I already mentioned. Um, although Albert never questioned the authenticity of the De Plantis, uh, he seems to recognize that it lacks uh, the rigor and the epistemic principles expected in an Aristotelian treatise. So to address the problem, Albert reorganized uh, the, the entire argumentation and also the, 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 the entire um, material that he found in the De Plantis to provide a more coherent discourse on plants. And in his account on vegetal sexuality, Albert combines Aristotelian natural philosophical doctrines on male and female with the Platonic doctrine of the scale of perfection, as we are going to see in just a few minutes. Um, animal perfection in relation to the plant's imperfection provides a template to explore the hidden dynamics of reproduction of plants. Albert makes a conceptual distinction between uh, the three levels of sexual differentiation one can find in nature. The first level is that uh, of the sexus, uh, that Albert intends as a, a sort of morphological differentiation into male and female organs. Let's uh, read together. The sex belongs to those substances generating by mating. One individual is ordered to emit the seed, and the other individual is ordered to take in it. In no way such distinction is present in plant. Um, the second level is the vera sexus virtus. The true reproductive power is in, is in the, the two seeds combined by mating. One of them is for the sake of the form, um, one of them is for the sake of the form, adducing the sensible soul, which is in in the seed. This is the male seed. The other one is the seed operated and configured in the form of organs of the same soul. This is the male seed, which is secondary, while that of a male is primary, as concerned the corporal substance, which it conveys. The third level, of uh, sexual differentiation is that that belongs to plant and it is the imitatio and reproduction of the true um, um, sexual potencies. In the imitation or reverberation of the true reproductive power, the active cause of the seed does not derive its formative and active power from an individual of the same species of what is generated. It suffices the stimulo of the earth of the sun and the aid operating in nature. Therefore, in the seeds of plants, there is just a resemblance, a similitudo, of the male and female sexes. The hottest residue of the seed operates and configures, whereas the moistest and the coldest is like the female seed, 
that is operated and configured. All in this way, one can conclude that there is a differentiation in the reproductive power also in plants. This is not true, but widely imitative. Um, in, line with, in line with the peripatetic tradition, Albert rejects the idea of a morphological sexual differentiation in plants uh, where two individuals have a different bodies and uh, that are ordered to, to, that are ordered to you know, perform two different functions. Uh, as we have seen before, the function of, uh, of uh, um, giving the seed and receive the seed. Um, however, in Albert's view, uh, this does not mean that one cannot theoretically distinguish material properties in the generation of plants that resemble, even in a widely imitative way, the basic functions of male and female in their, in their power of forming and being formed. And in Albert's view, it is true that plants do not imitate male and female bodies, but they surely imitate male and female function. As you can see here, uh, you have uh, a, 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 little bit, a little bit, you have a prospect where Albert he claims that male uh, plants imitate male seed uh, in, the, in their hot and dry property. And because these property are useful to perform the, 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 the function of, uh, of being active power of configuration. Uh, the female on the other side performs this passive power of being formed through these kind of qualities that one can find also in in the theme in the in the seeds of plants. Um, this already mentioned Albert Great deal with the topic of vegetal sexuality throughout his entire philosophical and theological production, and he discusses the topic again at the very end of his career in the Summa Theologiae. Um, the seed of plants does not display a sexual distinction through a male and female configuration, although, as Aristotle says in the De Plantis, there is in sex in plants is distinguished according to the function. Therefore, one can speak of male olive and female olive or consider the apple tree as female and the pear tree as a male due to the narrower leaves of the pear tree and the fruit that, that is harder than the apple. In fact, the wheat of the leaves and the softening of the fruits are signs of water humidity, which is a female feature. On the contrary, narrower leaves and hardness of the fruits are signs of hot humidity that is determined by the hearty dryness that is a masculine feature. Um, it appears clear that Albert here clarifies what he left unsaid in his De Vegetabilibus, and he clearly states that in plants the distinction between genders in fun is functional rather than morphological. Uh, moreover, he offers some qualitative and quantitative criteria to ascertain by means of the internal configuration of fruits, leaves, uh, seeds. Um, the preponderance of male and female properties also in two individual plants that belongs to the same species. Uh, it appears quite clear to me that Albert does not deny that the plants have sex, uh, that plants have uh, um, uh, the sexuality, display a sexuality, in a, in their, their plants do not lack. Uh, male and female to coup, but uh, they have a sort of imitation of this kind of uh, uh, sexual potency that they perform according to the, their bodies. Um, according to Albert the Great, the roles of male and female in the generative process extend behind providing uh, Ah, sorry, uh, we have uh, here um, a passage where Albert clearly, um, a, a reconstruction of Albert's doctrine on vegetal sexuality. We have uh, in plants, the sex cannot be distinguished per figura by means of sexual organs, but one can recognize the sex by the function. And we, if, if we analyze the quantitative and qu qualitative criteria, uh, that uh, quantitative and quantitative configuration that one can find in plants, uh, uh, we understand that they are, these are signs of male and female functions. Um, as I was saying, uh, Albert 
does not think that the role of male and females in the generative process ex um, uh, are limited to the, um, the the providing seed and receiving the seed, but extend beyond this uh, function and they also involve the sustaining of the embryo during the development and the also providing uh, protection and wealth for the offspring after after birth. Uh, in this way, Albert um, explore whether in plants there is a certain kind of imitation or a reverberation of maternal and paternal function or of such kind. And for example, he recognized that the root perform functions similar to that of the, uh, the padre familias, uh, uh, such as uh, the head of a household, the roots gathers nutrients uh, or wealth and distribute uh, these nutrients to all parts of the plant as needed. However, the analogy between animal and vegetal motherhood is more problematic. Uh, this is because not only plants lack an organ to serve as womb, where the embryo plant can be developed and nourished, but also because plants do not really give birth. As you can see here, Albert claimed that every generating animal has a place in which it configures uh, the embryo uh, and for, from which gives birth. However, plants do not have a place of such kind. Therefore, they cannot conceive nor give birth, probably speaking. Their way of reproduction is more appropriately defined as pollution. Um, the fact that the, um, the plants lack a real bird and does not prevent Albert from investigating by analogy how the soil carries out the rest of maternal function. By adapting the Galenic humoral complexion theory to the soil, Albert claims that, in fact, uh, the soil is a secret matrix in animalibus. It supports the formative process through a humor or a succus that is similar to the animal menstrual blood, thus guaranteeing a continuous su nutritional supply to the plants in development. The place of soil in which the plant rises is like the uterus in the animals and the succus or the humor that there is uh, that there is prepared and attracted is like the menstrual blood in the uterus of animals. So Albert Hill claims that just as um, the complexional qualities of the mother affect the complexion of the embryo, the complexional quality of the soil in which the generative process takes place affect the outcome of the process. According to Albert, in humoral physiology, the complexion passes from mother to child through the nourishment. For example, a body with a phlegmatic uh, complexion will produce a uh, phlegmatic nourishment, which converted in the substance of the uh, organic substance of the embryo will affect the complexional nature, the disposition of this generated. This is the reason why, according to Albert, one can compare the way in which animal mother affects the disposition of the embryo and the way in which the soil influences the disposition of a plant. The same comparison that exists between the disposition of the fetus and that of the uterus can be extended to the soil and the plant. This is because even though in the uterus, the operator is the main seed that as an artisan configures the embryo, nevertheless, the uterus affects in many ways the disposition of the fetus because the fetus intakes the menstrual blood as nourishment. The soil disposition, however, is the only one that modifies the disposition of a plant towards a domestic or a wild disposition. So Alvin here claims that while we can compare the way in which the, the uterus influences the, the complexion of the fetus, we have to make a distinction between the way in which the uterus, uh, the, the animal uterus affects the fetus and that of the soil and the, the, the soil affects, in the way in which the soil affects the, 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 com, the, com, the disposition of the plants. This is because in the, in the, the, the determination of the, compos the, of the disposition of the fetus is also involved a male 
seed and the formative power of the male seed that is uh, in charge of uh, configuring the embryo in image and in likeness of his uh, father. So in this way, in this project of, uh, as, as in this project, in, in the realizing this project of uh, reproducing the similarity between fathers and so on and, and child, uh, the, the formative power could be impeded by the interference of female uh, powers, uh, losing some potency and uh, thus allowing the expression of the resemblance with their maternal composition, uh, disposition. In the, in the determination of the complexio of the plants, no formative power is involved. Then it is exclusively the soil that affects the substantial quality of the embryo plant and consequently determining the wild or domestic nature of the complete plant when the plant reaches its um, complete form. Albert, however, um, identify another difference between animal uterus and uh, um, plants uterus, in this case, the soil. And, um, and this is the duration of the efficacy in determining the complexion. Differently from animals uterus, from animal uterus, the ability of the soil to determine the complexio of the plant is not limited to the embryogenetic process. Uh, as we have seen, even after having reached the, the perfect form intended by nature, the plant can change its complexion several times, depending on the diversity of quality uh, of the soil, the diversitas locorum. Um, this is possible because the nutritional relationship that is established between the soil and the plant, unlike that between the uterus and the embryo, is never interrupted. As we can see here, plants often change this position according to natural properties and to the diversity of places. The cause is that plant is attached to the soil as the embryo are attached to the uteruses and never separated from it. So the, the relationship, the nutritional relationship between plant and uh, its uterus uh, is never interrupted. And this consent uh, to the, this allow the, the, the soil to influence uh, uh, the composition on the composition and on the complexion of plants, even when the plants has reached its perfect plot, its perfect form. So, um, uh, and in Albert's view, for example, the, the, the mother influence, um, the mother um, disposition in the embryology of Albert the Great, the mother disposition does not influence uh, um, after giving birth, and neither in uh, in the case of breastfeeding, the breast the the, 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 the milk that mother offer uh, that mother offers to the child does not influence it, the, the, does does not incide and does not. Uh, um, have a, um, a sort of uh, um, have the, the power of changing the, the complexion of the of the fetus of the child after birth. But uh, as we can see here, plants uh, have the, the the soil have this power on plants. This is because there is a similarity between the matter of the the, the plant and the matter uh, of uh, of the soil. Um, Let's move to conclusion. And as we have seen in his account on vegetal sexuality, Albert combines the Aristotelian natural, philosophical, and also Galenic doctrine with the scale of perfection that he found in the Neoplatonic um, outlook on nature. The animal perfection in relation to the plant's imperfection provides a template to explore the hidden dynamics of reproduction of plants. Uh, the idea that every living being bears traces, signs uh, progressively less perfect and evident of the participation of the same archetypal structure leads Albert to solve the philosophical question of how plants embody sexual differences and at the same time offers a new valid instrument to interpret the dynamic of nature. I hope that in this reconstruction, I convince you that Harvard does not use the term imitatio in a negative sense to deny to crew that, male, that plants have male and female principles. But 
uh, these, he used these terms to indicate a relative imperfection, which on the one side measure marks the distance between the model and its imitation, and at the same time connect every natural being that bears the same trace, the traces of the same archetypal structure. And I will thank you. Uh, for your attention, and I will leave you uh, some uh, bibliographical references uh, very, very um, on the, the 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 question of the use of imitatio and the concept neoplatonic concept of the scale of perfection uh, in the, the the natural philosophy of Albert the Great, and also a recent publication of mine that uh, where all these. Uh, um, this, uh, where I where I, I discuss in a more detailed um, way uh, this topic that I I will I present to you today. Thank you for your attention.